I'm Robert Grant, and this is The Codex. In 2018, I published a paper titled The Accurate and Infinite Prediction of Prime Numbers Using a Novel Quasi-Prime Methodology. In this paper, I was able to figure out how to predict prime numbers, something that I had learned back in grade school was an impossibility. The way that I came to it was by figuring out that numbers actually operate in spirals of 24 repeating over and over and over again. As I looked at numbers in 24, I noticed also that the Fibonacci pattern also repeats when you look at it in digital root mathematics, collapsing every number down to single digits. For example, 27 would be two plus seven equals nine. In looking at it this way, I noticed that all the Fibonacci numbers would repeat themselves every 24 cycles. So I thought there must actually be something that's very fundamental to 24. So as I wondered what that relationship to 24 might actually be, I couldn't also help but think about the famous words of the late great physicist Stephen Hawking, who posited that in order for us to have a unified physics model for the universe, that we would have to also solve prior to that time the relationship between mathematical constants like pi and the golden number phi, and many others. As I thought about that, I also couldn't help but think about the relationship to music. Now, mathematicians throughout history have very often also been musicians. Pythagoras is probably the first great example of that. Pythagoras taught us that math and music are actually one. What Pythagoras noticed was that if he continued to play with strings and cut a string down small enough, he could actually see the relationship, if he always did it in halves, that would cause doubling and halving of octaves infinitely, all the way up until we could no longer hear sound anymore. At a certain stage, at about 20,000 cycles per second, human beings can't hear any more the notes that go above that, but they actually continue to go all the way up. This was fascinating to me this concept of music and math being the same thing. So I thought to myself, wouldn't it be possible to relate musical notes to prime numbers? And if I could relate musical notes to prime numbers, would I not then also be able to relate musical notes to mathematical constants and see what those relationships might actually yield for us? So through that process, I did exactly that. The seminal effort was really tied to the simple concept of what if I dropped two pebbles into a still pond? What happens with the waves that overlap each other? And as they crash into each other, they create these intersections. And as these intersections basically create wave interferences within themselves, both constructive and destructive interference patterns emerge. I posited then also that possibly where those waves are intersecting is exactly relational to a modular arithmetic or a view in spirality of the number 24. And it turned out to be correct. 24 is a basic pattern that represents both a sine and cosine relationship. Now you might remember back in school, we all studied sine and cosine relationships in both geometry and trigonometry. I started thinking about this a little bit more deeply and as I got deeper and deeper into it, I realized that this is just a beautiful language. This language that we can see in the form of geometry and really that geometry is nothing more than just the sound that we enjoy with our eyes. I learned more and more about this relationship of these musical notes and how what I've been seeing with my eyes my entire life could actually even be represented is just wave patterns of sound. Now 24, you could break it into two pieces and both sides would be 12. And this is why we have 12 notes in each octave. And as we double an octave, then of course 24 goes to 48 by doubling it again, and so on. So here again, the entire prime number pattern repeats itself infinitely 
through a musical representation in such a beautiful way. One other aspect of this as well is that the sound that we listen to and the musical notes we listen to are actually directly related to the geometries. In fact, the geometries that underlie those sounds might actually help us to understand more about how to precisely tune those sounds to our greatest benefit. And that's one of the things that's been a long-term dream of mine, that one day I would be able to figure out how to tune our DNA, like keys on a piano keyboard, with very high precision, because I believe that the healing mechanisms will not be pharmacologic in the future, but rather sound-based. Because sound is able to penetrate through our bodies, through all of our cells. And if we could figure out how to precisely tune it, might that not have a big impact on our biology and our own wellness and well-being? You know, Leonardo da Vinci also faced this similar challenge. Right in the Vitruvian Man, most people don't notice that there's actually a page number written in the upper right-hand corner of the Vitruvian Man, which is kind of bizarre because, first of all, it's not written backwards in mirrored text. If you notice, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, it looks to be right adjacent to a fold line, as if it's a page in a book. There's also a backwards mirrored text of the letter B that's tail is pointing straight to a number. Now that number, as we get close up on it, is actually 126. Now this was something that was really sort of enigmatic for me when I first saw it, because first of all, was the Vitruvian Man part of a book? Not really. It was a loose leaf representation of, you know, one of his sketches. But why would he write the number 126 as if it's a page number and then point to it with a backwards letter B? Well, I had to go even further into understanding what da Vinci might be referring to. And it takes you all the way back to around the fourth century BC, where Plato is actually speaking to the Greek Senate at a time of great unrest in his country of Greece. The unrest was due to the great plague of Athens that swept through the city in 430 BC during the Peloponnesian War that claimed nearly 100,000 lives. In an attempt to stop the spread of the plague, leaders in Greece sought the help of famed philosopher Plato. After Plato failed to find a solution, they consulted the Oracle of Delphi who told them, The simple solution is, you must double the size of the altar to the sun god Apollo, and if you can perfectly double its volume, then the plague will dissipate. In short, the ancient Greeks had to solve the mathematical problem of doubling the volume of a cube. The answer turns out to be the cubed root of two, which is approximately 1.26. Now this has a very, very important relationship to music itself. Pythagoras had taught us that in order to form a musical scale, we can do it with a perfect fifth. And the perfect fifth relationship is three over two. So in terms of music, if you know music well, you could say that a perfect fifth relationship for the note C at middle C would become a G note. From this, you can figure out how to populate a lot of the scale. But in order to complete an entire scale, you must also include something called a major third. Now the major third is a mathematical interval relationship that was defined by Pythagoras as being five over four, or 1.25. The challenge is though, is that if you start to populate a scale using the interval that Pythagoras had actually outlined in something called just tuning, starting with 432 hertz as your A note, after a while, when you start 
taking those intervals of three over two to populate the next perfect fifth, as well as the major third relationship of five over four, you find a discrepancy emerges. It becomes impossible to actually double the octave through the major third. So this is a real challenge. Musically, Pythagoras taught us, well, we can make up for this challenge by replacing this method of just tuning with another approach that uses something called a Pythagorean comma, which sort of makes up for this slight difference that in octave doubling creates this discrepancy that doesn't allow you to double the octave. But the problem is no different than the solution that had to be found during the plague in ancient Greece. I had the idea to replace the 1.25 using just tuning with 1.26 instead the cube root of two. Now in this context, we actually see the symmetry that nature can apply of the perfect fifth, which is three, o three over two, as well as a new approach to a major third using the cube root of two. So as we get deeper into this, we can now see that using this new tuning approach, which I decided to name precise temperament tuning, we can find that every note in this context, starting from 432 hertz, will also have a digital sum of nine, without exception. But unlike most tuning standards that end at a, an approach that would kind of have a whole number value, this goes into fractional representations. Equal temperament tuning does as well. But this is very different because even the fractional decimal extension, even every one of those numbers in every three digits will sum to the number nine. And this happens naturally as a consequence of simply replacing the cube root of two, 1.26, for the prior 1.25, five over four major third relationship. This is an extraordinarily controversial topic amongst the musical community. Prior to 1939, there was no tuning standard. In 1939, an international organization decided to put together a global tuning standard. It was headed by John D. Rockefeller and his organization. At that time, they decided that although many people around the globe were using different tuning standards, they wanted to standardize it to a simple 440 hertz. Now the challenge with that was that if we add up four plus four plus zero, does it equal nine? It must answer at nine. If not, it will not have a perfect geometric correspondence. And as I said, geometry is simply the music that we listen to with our eyes and our sight. Maybe when music has been written by the likes of Bach and Verdi, and Mozart, they intended to have certain notes have certain emotional qualities and texture and context come along with them. There's a certain quality that is intended to provide a contrast. Does our current equal temperament system provide us with that degree of contrast reference? And I don't believe it does. So what happens if we now change that process? Let's have a listen to see what precise temperament tuning sounds like. Isn't that beautiful? Now, where else do we see music coming in the form of matter? Well, we see it in even the periodic table of elements. Now, Mendeleev refers to the periodic table on a linear table, but nothing in nature is on a linear table. Instead, it's a spiral. We've renamed that the periodic wave of elements, where every single element in the periodic wave is just another musical representation 
from a family of notes created from perfect fifths and major thirds. Even isotope relationships on this periodic wave are created from the musical interval relationships that exist inherent to nature. All of it operating off the simple principle as well of a base nine mathematics. If we look at the polygons that are all around us every day, an equilateral triangle is a good place to start. Equilateral meaning that it has three angles that are interior angles and each is 60 degrees. They sum to 180 degrees. Notice one plus eight plus zero equals nine. Let's move on to a square. 360 degrees are the sum of angles of the interior angles of a square. 360 degrees is three plus six plus zero equals nine. How about moving on now to a pentagon? 540 degrees is the sum of its interior angles. Five plus four plus zero equals nine. Now what if we made a conversion for those different geometric forms that we call polygons. And we converted simply each of their values into Hertz frequencies using the exact same conversion value. What do we get? Well, nothing other than the most beautiful five-part harmony of F-sharp major chord. What we're seeing with our eyes is really just the F-sharp major chord in five-part harmony, and we're looking at it as polygonal geometric forms. Now, you might ask, well, is this true for three-dimensional geometry as well? And how about hypercubes and tesseracts? The answer is yes. You will not find a geometric form that exists in the Archimedean solids or Platonic solids, or what's also called and referred to as the Catalan dual solids even that doesn't sum to the number nine. If this is the case, shouldn't we be looking differently at how and what we allow the music to enter into our lives to be? Maybe also, this is why we're so attracted to geometric forms. Maybe at a subtle level, our brains are nothing more than QR code readers as we look at geometry all around us every moment of every day, always looking for the signature of the source. And often we see that represented as mathematical constants and one of them in particular, the golden ratio, 1.618. The golden ratio defines what we look at and conceive as beautiful around us, just as it does so in music as well. The golden ratio is based off of a number series called the Fibonacci series of numbers. So as we look at each of these numbers, we notice that the relationship between each of these successive numbers, the larger the number becomes, is 1.618 multiplied by the prior number. Maybe this relationship is something so much more fundamental that we should all be studying to understand it because it becomes the signature of universal source. Is it possible that even the geometry that we see around us is formed simply by some musical note that is either above our audible spectrum or below our audible spectrum? Sound emanating out from the silence. Is that also what is separating light from darkness? As we look at a unification theory of science, I can't help but think about the famous words of Leonardo da Vinci, learn the art of science and study the science of art. Realize that everything is connected. Learn how to see. I believe fundamentally that the way for us to learn how to see is first and foremost to notice that everything is connected. There is no action that we see in this world that doesn't have an underlying relationship to another action. We're all connected 
through that series of myriad of interactions that most of which cannot even be perceived by us, but they're always there. A good way to look at the universe around us is to notice that even in things like cymatics, we can see new structure and new form and new organization and new pattern in our universe. It's a beautiful thing. I believe that the entire universe is patterned. What we refer to as random is really only the parts of the universe that we haven't figured out the encryptions for yet. The encryption exists, the pattern exists. It's just above and beyond our zone of perception and intelligence. Let me talk a little bit about dimensions. Let's start with a simple line. A line is the first dimension. Now let's place another axis point on that line, and now we can measure those two points of intersection and finish them out in mirror form. Now we have a square or any other form. We measure that in area. The next form would be to pop that out with a Z axis so that we can see the third dimension of that cube now. So the square turns into a cube. But the next form after that would actually be a cube that would rotate. Now, we think about a cube as a third dimension, but it's stationary. In order for us to experience life, all life is in motion. Therefore, we have to accept and understand that we live in the fourth dimension, where the fourth dimension is the axis of motion. We measure motion through time. The next dimension is simply an expansion of time. We see time as a linear one-way street function, but the principles of music and physics would point to the fact that all dimensions of time exist simultaneously. And if that is so, then the next experience for us as a higher dimension as we push the boundary of the persistence of our own perception will be to experience different dimensions happening simultaneously of time itself. And we call that the fifth dimension. And we can look at this as a musical relationship as well. In fact, we can say that the first dimension could be measured as the number six. Six, then of course we could take it to the next dimension that it would go six squared. So six squared would be 36. And we can also add a simple zero to that, which makes it 360. Immediately we think of the 360 degrees of a circle. Then the next level is going to be to take that to the next power. Six to the third power equals 216. We can add a zero to that. And interestingly, it turns out to be the form of a cube because the sum of angles of a cube is 2,160 degrees. Now we take that to the next level, we get 1,296. Isn't that number another number that shows up somewhere else? In fact, it is. It shows up in the compass. A compass has 1,296,000 seconds. Does that then mean that a compass is actually the best reference for measuring time? Time and space are inseparable. Maybe our experience with time now must also expand to the next level. Because if we took it to the next power, again, by adding those zeros to it, it goes one, two, nine, six, which was six to the fourth power, six to the fifth power becomes 7,776. Does that mean now that we have more volume with which to measure a hypercube in motion that is no longer in one direction, but can go multiple directions? As we contemplate these very deep questions, we have to ask ourselves, 
who is the conductor behind this beautiful symphony that's happening all around us every single day of our entire lives. Most times we don't even notice what's happening around us. And think about all the things we miss out on. But as we learn the language of universal consciousness, which is a language based on music and light mixed with dark, we can actually see the creation all around us in every single moment of our experience. When we do that, we start to feel at one.